Welcome everybody to our Bible class Wednesday night. And again, we thank everyone for joining us tonight. We're just going to do like a, a little review and a conclusion of uh, the message that we've been doing um, uh, concerning the spirit realm and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And so uh, we'll have a little bit more time for Q&A um, if you have any questions concerning anything that we talked about. So tonight uh, is going to be a, a conclusion of what we've been teaching. And uh, again, I hope we've been a blessing to you in this area of reigning with Christ. All right, so as we move forward into the message tonight, we were reviewing from last week. We read from Isaiah, and we can start there. We can go to Isaiah chapter number two. And I believe I read from the King James Version. And uh, I also want to go to Micah, the book of Micah, chapter number four. Uh, we read that from the King James, but tonight I want to just uh, read that again, but I want to read it from the New Living Translation this time. So I'll start out with Isaiah from the King James Version, Isaiah chapter number two. And um, I, again, get something to write with because um, you're not going to have a whole lot of scriptures in the PowerPoint tonight. I may just quote some scriptures to you and you have to write them down. Isaiah chapter number two. We talked about God's kingdom being established in the earth with Jesus being king of kings and having his headquarters in Jerusalem. And we will be reigning with him in different parts of the world, the saints of God in our glorified bodies, reigning here on the earth, no one else on the earth like us. And that's why we're gonna rule and reign during that time. And then we read some of these scriptures here in Isaiah to show you what the setup will be like. So I will read that, but then I want to read uh, Micah chapter four from the New Living Translation. So just a few verses from Isaiah, and you can follow along again. Chapter number two, starting at verse number one. It says, the, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days, we're in the last days, family, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain, and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations will flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we established that, that he will be the one who established the laws of the land. So out of Jerusalem will go forth the law and the word of God. So it will not just be the law of the land, but it will also be the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And that established that his headquarters will be there in Jerusalem. Verse number four. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So God's gonna put an end to all conflict and war on the earth when his kingdom is established in the earth. It's gonna be a kingdom of peace, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So those are, we ended the message talking about that last time, that this is the kingdom that's gonna be ushered in during that thousand years, it's gonna be a kingdom of righteous living, in the earth, all right? Everybody conforming to righteous living. Um, because as we look at the world today, we see mankind have not done a good job with running the planet the way God wanted things to be ran. And so what God is gonna do is he's gonna allow the saints to come back, rule the world, rule the planet with his influence from Jerusalem. So again, he's gonna come back and allow the church to come and show the world how the planet is supposed to be ran with God's influence. Again, government is an institution that was established by God. Man didn't come up with the idea of government. That was God's institution. And so God expected mankind to govern earth, but with his influence. And so anytime mankind tried to govern the planet without God's influence, it leads to chaos. So God is gonna allow the church to come back and show the world how this thing is supposed to be done. Oh, we're looking forward to that day. That's going to be so exciting. So again, it says, 
Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit more when we get to uh, Micah. Then verse number five says, O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Come on, family, let us walk in the light of the Lord, children of the light. Let's do those things that are pleasing in God's sight so that we can usher in the kingdom of God. We can usher in this kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy. Come on, children of God, let us walk in the light. I believe that God is waiting on the church to get it right, to truly represent him in the earth like we should. And then that can hasten his coming, especially when we go and we preach the good news of the gospel like he has commissioned us to in the scriptures. So now let's go to the book of Micah. The book of Micah chapter number four, and that's right after the book of Jonah. And this time I wanna read this one from the New Living Translation, because I like the way it reads in this one. Then and it makes it uh, a little bit more easier to understand. This is bearing witness to the word that God gave Isaiah in chapter two that we just read. But look how this reads in the New Living Translation. It says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills. So in the last days, when God established his kingdom in the earth, with the headquarters being in, the, in Jerusalem. The Bible says this will be the most important place on the whole entire planet. It will be raised above all other hills. All people from all over the world will stream there to worship. So everybody, not just in one continent, but all over the entire world is gonna be coming to headquarters to get the law and to hear the word of the Lord. So it says people are gonna be streaming there to worship. Verse number two, people from many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. Verse three, the Lord will mediate between people. So he's gonna be the mediator. And remember, Isaiah had prophesied before, we read that in chapter nine, that when he established his government on earth, where the prophet said, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called wonderful counselor, um, prince of peace, mighty God, the everlasting father. So he's gonna be the one that's gonna mediate between people. He's gonna help people settle their disputes because again, mankind do not have all the wisdom on how to settle disputes. In other words, when we can't come together in agreement, we go to war with one another. And when God establishes kingdom on earth, he's gonna show us there's a way to settle dispute without killing each other. So he's gonna mediate between all nations. I love it. The Lord will mediate between people and it's, listen to this, and will settle disputes between strong nations far away. So again, Jesus is gonna help and show people how we settle our dispute. There will be no more nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Jesus is gonna show them how do we settle our disputes. There's a way in which we can settle our disputes without being violent, without hurting one another, without taking one another's life and without fighting in war because there really is no winner in war. Too many lives are lost. Too many families are devastated when we go to war. So nobody wins when we go to war. And Lucifer knows that. But you gotta remember, his goal is, and his motive has always been to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And when mankind lose sight of that, we go to war because we have differences and we don't realize that Satan is behind it to destroy us. And we got to understand that we are in spiritual warfare and Satan is out to destroy the creation of God. So the Bible says here, the Lord will mediate between people and will settle disputes between strong nations afar off. So we're talking about strong nations, you know, uh, powerful nations. 
Dawn's going to show them how we settle disputes during that time. It's going to be awesome. Wow. It says, they will hammer their swords into plowshares. So they're going to hammer their swords in, this one says. That means that there's going to be no need for it. There's going to be no need for preparation for war again. So you can hammer it in and make sure you don't even try to pull it out. You won't even be able to pull it out. Normally, when you hammer something in, you can't pull it out with your hand. You know, it takes a tool, like the fork of the hammer to pull it out. So he says, they're going to hammer their swords into plowshares. So when you go to grab it, it'll be stuck to remind you we're living in a total different time now, in the time of God's kingdom, where there will be total peace. So they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation. See there? No training for war anymore. Isn't that wonderful? God said during the time of the thousand year, Nation will not go to war against nation because he's going to show them how to settle their disputes. And not only that, there will be no training for war. No more training. No more Uncle Sam's army training to go to battle. There will be no need to train because during that time is going to be perfect peace. Glory to God. The Bible tells us God will keep us in that perfect peace if we keep our minds stayed on him. So that lets us know that even though we're living during this disposition, this dispensation of grace, we can have that peace that we're going to have in that thousand year reign in this time. How do you have it? By keeping your mind stayed up on him, keeping your mind on the word of God, meditating in that word day and night. And so that way you can have the peace of God in your soul and in your heart. And I believe it says that in the book of Isaiah, that those that keep their minds stayed upon him he will keep you in perfect peace. So during that time, it's going to be perfect peace. And again, we can have that perfect peace now if we keep our mind stayed on him. This is beautiful. I love it. I love the teaching. This is why we need to encourage one another with this kind of teaching of the kingdom of God that's coming to the earth. This is encouraging. In the light of all the things that's, that has happened in the past on this planet, things that we're presently going through now and what it looked like we're heading towards, this is encouraging to know that God's kingdom is coming. Hallelujah, glory of, of, the, of the kingdom in which we are a part of if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Glory to God. Remember, we shared that last time from Luke chapter number 11. We should be praying, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there will be no more training, um, Micah says. Uh, there will be no more training for war. Beautiful. Verse number four, I like this part right here. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity. Oh, that's beautiful. Listen, not a selected few enjoying peace and prosperity, but the scripture says here, everyone. How many are left out of everyone? No one. This includes everyone during that time. Everyone will live in peace and in prosperity. So it's gonna be a time of peace. It's going to be a time of prosperity and everybody going to enjoy it. In other words, the playing field is going to be level. Isn't that beautiful? We're at a time now where it's not level. And there are those who enjoy prosperity and enjoy their worldly peace. But the time is coming that that's going to change. Jesus is going to see to it that the playing field is level. And it says there, everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying. Oh, that's beautiful. That, that, that just shows that's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Everyone living in peace. And the way we live in peace is by being people who are righteous. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost based on this verse that we just read. Everyone will live in peace because we will be living in righteousness during that time and in prosperity, enjoying, it says prosperity, enjoying their own grapevine and fig tree. So I love it. Everyone will live in peace and in prosperity, enjoying their own grapevines and fig trees. That's beautiful. That during that time, it's going to be peace, it's going to be righteousness, it's going to be joy. Everyone will be able to enjoy their own grapevine and their own fig tree. In other words, you're going to have your own 
your own land, your own house, your own property, and you'll be able to enjoy it. Glory, that's gonna be awesome. And nobody will be able to take it from you for no reason. No reason whatsoever are they gonna be able to come and take it from, from you. You know, as we live in this time, sometime when um, maybe we may fall behind in our payments, we fall behind in our mortgage payment, or we fall behind in our taxes. You know, they're gonna be coming quickly after several months to take that which you're trying to pay for it so that you can own one day. You won't even have to worry about that during that time. Nobody gonna come and take anything from you. You're gonna be able to enjoy your own grapevine, your fig tree, your own fig tree in your own yard or your own acres, plural, and it will belong to you. And nobody will be able to come in and take it at no time. Isn't that gonna be beautiful? This is the kind of kingdom that Jesus is gonna set up. There will be no need for no one to come and take anything that you have because the playing field is level. And everyone, according to what we just read, will be operating in peace and in prosperity. So if everybody's prospering, there's no need for me to come and take what you have or to cover it what you have because we're all walking in prosperity. Isn't that beautiful? Glory to God. See, it's gonna be a whole different time. So there will be no need to cover your neighbor's good because you can have that which your neighbor has. At that point, everybody's gonna be in peace and in prosperity, enjoying their own grapevines, the own fruit of your labor. It's a beautiful thing that when you have worked and you have labored for a portion of your life and you can sit back and look and say, look what the Lord has done through my hands. Look what the Lord has provided through my hands. And then he allows us to enjoy it. It's a beautiful thing. It's a sense of accomplishment when you can look back and look at the things that you've accomplished that God have allowed you to accomplish through him and for his glory. It's a, it's a great feeling to have. So during that time, it's gonna, you're gonna have that type of joy on the inside of accomplishment of what we have achieved during the time that we were here. Glory to God, during the time of grace. And just to, uh, have you, just to give you a scripture reference, as I said before, this is gonna be a time of peace and. Uh, righteousness, peace, and joy, Holy Ghost. The scripture that talks about peace in Isaiah is Isaiah chapter number uh, 26, and that's verse number three. All right, that's the one that said he'll keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed upon him. So I, we look forward to that time where we'll be able to have our own and nobody be able to take that which God has blessed us with. I love that. That, that really blessed me when I began to read this from the New Living Translation. So I'm gonna read that again, uh, verse number four. Everyone will live in peace and in prosperity, enjoying their own grape vines and fig tree, for there will be nothing to fear. Oh, I love it. There will be nothing to fear, nothing and no one. The spirit of fear will no longer operate in the earth. And we know that Adam opened up that door for the spirit of fear to operate when you look in the book of Genesis, when God came looking for him in the garden after he sinned. And the Bible says, Adam hid himself among the trees. And God called out to him and said, Adam, where are you? And then Adam responded, he said, I hid myself because I was afraid. I was naked and I was afraid. And God asked him, who, who told you you were naked? All right, so we know that Adam opened up the door. That's the first time we see the word afraid in the Bible in Genesis. So Adam opened up that door for fear to come in. And then we saw, as we continue to read in scripture, you saw some of the things that happened to Job because Job also had fear. You know, all the things that happened to his son, look what Job said prior to all those things happened. He said, I fear that my children had cursed God in their heart. That's why the Bible says Job went before God, you know, regularly to pray for his children. So read the beginning of the book of Job, the first two, three chapters, before all the catastrophe started happening to Job. Look what Job, Job had like a premonition that this was going to happen to his children. And he said it. He said he had a fear that his children was gonna, that what his children would curse God. And so since he had this uh, premonition that his kids actually was cursing God by their activity and the way that they were living, that some bad things were gonna happen. So I believe just like Adam opened up that door of fear <coughs> in the garden, Job did the same thing. <clears throat> he opened up that door of fear. He opened up that door of fear when he said in his heart, I fear that my children have cursed God. So again, we can bring things upon us 
uh, in our life when we give Satan access to our life through fear and being afraid. So the scripture tells us here that there will be nothing to fear. There will be nothing and no one to fear. Isn't that a beautiful feeling? That you'll be able to walk anywhere, go anywhere, travel anywhere with no sense of fear. See, we can't do that now because certain places you travel, you can't go everywhere. You know, you go some places that you're, that's forbidden in a country that you're not familiar with. It's a possibility that you may not come back. So you, you can't go everywhere without having some sense of fear, you know, for your life because you don't know the surroundings. You don't know the people in the area. But during that time, the Bible says there will be nothing to fear. So regardless of where you travel in the world, because remember, mortals are still going to be here. And many things that set up in the world are still going to be set up the way it's set up, but there's going to be a major change. There's going to be a major change. All right, there's going to be a major change when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom here. So we'll be able to travel anywhere in the world without a sense of fear. Because the scripture tells us there will be nothing to fear. What a beautiful time. What a beautiful reign it's going to be for that whole thousand years. Just something to think about, just to be able to do that, just to travel anywhere in the world without a sense of fear. You know, fear can come in for many reasons. You travel to a place where you don't know the language. So it's harder for you to get around. It's harder for you to understand what's going on in that particular country. But the Bible says we will know even as we are known. So that means we'll have the ability to speak as, as God knows all language. We will have the ability to comprehend all languages. Isn't that beautiful? Remember that. We're going to be immortal people that's going to be traveling at the speed of thought. And wherever we go, we can speak the language. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. You talk about how awesome this reign is going to be. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have it entered into the hearts of men. The good things. Wow, that God has in store for those that love him. We know how difficult it is now just to try to learn two different languages. You know, there's some who are bold that learn several languages, three, four, five different languages. We know how hard it is sometimes just to be able to master one language. God got to make it so that his people who are immortal got to be able to understand every language. So wherever you go, there'll be no sense of fear and you'll be able to communicate with all people. Isn't that awesome? Wow, family of God, you want to be there? I'm telling you, you want to be there for that which God has in store for us. So I love what it says there. There will be nothing to fear. Nothing. We'll be walking in peace. Perfect peace. Then the Bible says, perfect love cast out fear. We will be walking in that perfect love of God during that time. Everything's going to be perfect. And because God's love will reach its maturity at that point, it will cast out fear. Perfect love. And we know, based on some of the teachings I've been given at the church, that that word perfect implies maturing. Maturing faith. So how does that apply to us now in this dispensation called grace? Maturing faith casts out fear. So as you mature, all right, in your love, as you mature in your faith and as you mature in your love, perfect love, maturing love, cast out fear. So as you mature in your love walk with God, it causes fear to leave your life. Isn't that beautiful? Walking in the love of God. Hallelujah. Maturing in our love walk with one another. First loving God with all our hearts and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. Oh, glory. God is preparing us to reign in his kingdom. Everything that we're doing now in this dispensation of grace is preparing us to reign when his kingdom come. I love it. I love it. So again, as we look into this, we see other things that are opening up as to what we're going to be doing and the ability that we're going to have during that thousand years. And remember I said, we did not have the opportunity to experience what the garden was like before Adam sinned. Adam lived in a utopia. He lived in heaven on earth. Even though Satan was in the garden, he didn't have access to Adam's world until he started speaking to the woman and the woman was deceived and the man was right there and he didn't stop it. And the, and the man gave them access, gave Satan access into our world. And from that day, it's been nothing but chaos. But prior to that, 
we don't have a lot of what happened before Adam sinned. And remember, there really was no time set in the garden. Time didn't come into play until Adam ate from the tree that God told him not to eat. So how many years did Adam live prior to him sinning? We don't have scriptures to tell us how long, but it could have been, it could have been thousands of years. Because remember, he wasn't growing old. That's awesome. That's something to think about. Because remember, age didn't kick in. Time didn't kick in until after Adam and Eve sinned. So prior to that, they were living in, in eternity, in, in the realm of God, where there is no time. So how long Adam was alive? Because his body wasn't growing old. So we don't know how many years, because we think in terms of years as human beings, but we don't know how long Adam lived with God in the garden before he sinned. So my point is, we didn't get an opportunity to experience what Adam experienced before he sinned. But this is, this is why God is going to allow us to come back. The saints, only the believers, only those who obey him, like Adam was supposed to do in the garden. So only the people that's going to come back and reign for the thousand years are those that obey him, like God told Adam, you need to obey me. And those who have not obeyed, we can repent and get in line so that we can enjoy. Glory to God. So as Adam destroyed that by allowing Satan to come in, you know, we're experiencing chaos and we have not had the opportunities to see what that world was like before Adam messed up. So again, everything is going to go back to the way it was in the days of Adam. I think I pointed that out to you from the book of Romans chapter eight, I believe I told you that, where creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. All of creation is waiting for us to be manifested on this earth as the glorified children of God. Creation is waiting. And so when we get to that point where we reign with him in a thousand years, we're going to experience the garden for a whole thousand years. Beautiful. And remember, that was God's intent for man to experience a day in the garden. Experience a day, a thousand years. But we know that no man lived to be a thousand. Only Methuselah lived to be 969. And he missed it by 31 years. So he didn't even make it to the end of a, of a day. But God is going to allow us to make sure this is why the reign is for a thousand years. Everybody going to reign with him for one day. Hallelujah. That's beautiful. What a time to look forward to. So again, it says there, there will be nothing to fear during that time. I love it. It says the Lord of heaven's army has made this promise. This is a promise, folks. This is a promise from God that these things are going to come to pass, that these, this, this, this is going to happen. It's not a nursery rhyme. It's not a fairy tale. This is the word of the Lord. The zeal of the Lord has spoken it. It's not by power or by might, but God says by my spirit that this is going to happen. For the Lord is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Lord of the heaven army has made this promise. God made a promise to us that this is what he's gonna do for his children. That's why John says in the epistle of John, what manner of love is this that the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God? But it doth not yet appear unto us what we shall be. In other words, we don't have that glorified body, but this one thing we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We're gonna see him as he is. We're gonna be just like him. Oh, how we wanna be just like him. Isn't that what we're striving to do now here on earth? We're living our life to be like him. Glory to God. All right, let's continue. I think I've read most of the verse there. Uh, okay, let's finish out the verse. We're in verse number five now. So it says, the, the, Lord's, the Lord of the heaven army has made this promise. Though the nations around us follow their idols, we will follow the Lord our God forever and ever. All right, so there'll be some nations that still, with all these different world religion, Remember now, we're still coming, we're coming back to a world that's similar to what we left seven years ago before being raptured. So all the different religions and things that's still in the world will still be here. But guess what? All those religions are going to be torn down. And there are some that's still going to be worshiping their God until they start flowing into Jerusalem. And until we start flowing into all the different parts of the world and sharing the good news of the kingdom again, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. Remember, Jesus was preaching the kingdom is coming. As a matter of fact, John even preached his cousin. That was John the Baptist's message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So even prior to Jesus coming, his cousin was preaching about the kingdom. 
So during that time, when we go fast forward now to the thousand year reign, there are gonna be a whole lot of people here with all these different world religion, but all that's gonna change. And you know what, towards the end of the tribulation period, Satan and the Antichrist is really going to be working towards what is called a one world religion, where everybody worship under one umbrella, worshiping the Antichrist. Again, Satan imitating God because he's really imitating the thousand reign, the, 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 the reign of Christ, the thousand year millennial reign, where all kingdoms are going to flow under the kingdom of God. All nations are going to come and worship. So there will be some people that still worship the way they worship until the law goes forward from Jerusalem and the word of God, and we, the super beings, the immortal beings that's traveling at the speed of, of thought, faster than the speed of sound, faster than the speed of light, but at the speed of thought, going into all the world and making correction. That's why we read earlier in Isaiah, it says in chapter two that he's gonna rebuke a many people. He's gonna rebuke a whole lot of nations. And so we're going to have to go and set people straight all over the world with their false religion and that which they have been exposed to, to think that the way they're worshiping is truth. We're going to have to rebuke many people. But guess what? They're going to have to line up because they're not going to be able to do anything about it. See, when we look at the time that we're in now, when we speak the word of God in the time of dispensation called grace, the time that we're living in now, Sometimes we might be a little apprehensive with sharing certain things because we know our life can be put on the line. People are threatened sometimes by the word of God. They're threatened by the coming of his kingdom. But guess what? During that time, there will be no need to fear. There will be no threat on your life because no one will be able to kill you. No mortal person will be able to take your life. So you'll be able to declare the word of God with boldness during that time. So we're going to rebuke a whole lot of folks to say your way of worshiping is erroneous it's wrong worshiping the unknown god to the unknown god almost like what apostle paul said when he went to athens and he saw this uh a monument that was erected and, a, and, and an inscription written on the monument said to the unknown god so they they erect all these monuments and they worship these monuments but on the on the uh, on the bottom of the monument they had an inscription that says to the unknown god so they're worshiping these idols and they don't even know whether he's God or not. They said, we're worshiping the unknown God. This is our God, but he's unknown. Aren't you glad we serve a God that we can have a relationship with? That's beautiful. We got a God that we have a relationship with. He has a relationship with us. He's not unknown to us. We're not unknown to him. He knows us by name and we know his voice. Isn't that awesome? He said, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow but flee from. Hallelujah. Glory. So we're going to rebuke a whole lot of folks for their erroneous uh, doctrine and religion. And that's why we taught for a long time. We don't have religion. We have relationship. Because religion is really man's attempt to try to please God by doing things. God don't need you to do things for him to please him. He just needs you to be obedient and follow his word and do what he said do. He's in control. He's in charge. He made everything and he know how things ought to go. So religion is man's attempt to do things to please God. So we come up with all of these traditions and you can't do this and you can't wear that and you can't go here. And you can, Listen, God said he don't need all of that. Just obey the word. If you love me, keep my commandments. So we're going to be rebuking a lot of people, but we're going to be able to do it without fear. And even at this time, we should be able to do it without fear with the Holy Ghost in our life. That's why he gave you the spirit and you shall have power to be witnesses for me. We said that before in Acts chapter one, verse eight. This is why you got power so that you can witness without fear. Glory to God. So we're going to rebuke a lot of people during that time. And we're going to set them straight. And once we set them straight, this is why everybody's going to be flowing to Jerusalem. Because once they hear the message, they're going to want to leave where they are. I don't care what continent they are on. And remember, they can't travel the way we travel. They still going to have to get in their airplanes. Uh, and their spaceships or whatever they're going to have during that time and make their trip. And we'll be there when we get there. We let, let them go ahead and fly. And once they get there, if we need to go there and meet them there. We'll just think about it and we'll be there. Woo, glory. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know how, what, what is this doing to your thinking, but when I think about it, it's like amazing the ability that we're going to have as believers. All right. Glory to God. All right, so we got this now, this promise that the heaven army, the Lord of the heaven army have made to us. 
And I told you that, and let me finish reading that verse on five. It says, um, the nations round us, it says, though the nation round us follow their idols, we will follow the Lord our God forever and ever. I believe that during that time when Jesus' kingdom reigns on the earth, all idols will be torn down. All monuments that are erected in the earth that does not give glory to God will be torn down. All statues that are erected that does not give glory to God will be torn down in every nation. Wait a minute. Could this be a prerequisite of what we're seeing now with folks marching and tearing down statues? Is this a prerequisite of what's going to happen during the millennial reign? Selah, something to think about. Look what's happening in our time. People are tearing down these statues and monuments that does not speak to the liberation of all people. They're tearing it down because it doesn't represent everybody. Well, that's what's gonna happen during that time. All idols are gonna be torn down. If you read that verse number five, it talks about the idols. All idols and statues will be ripped down, torn down. So I believe what we're seeing now is a prerequisite of what's gonna come during that thousand years. The saints are gonna go down, go around and tear down all idols and all statues that do not represent God and his kingdom. Because remember at that time, his kingdom is gonna be the dominant kingdom in the earth. The one world religion or the one world relationship, put it that way, because remember we don't have religion, we have relationship. So the one world relationship with the God of creation, who's here on the earth in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, awesome, awesome. So again, you can continue to read the rest of the chapter if you like, but I stop right there. So again, I wanted to read that from the New Living, Transla uh, New Living Translation, the book of Micah. So to show you what it's gonna be like and the peace and the righteousness and the joy that we're gonna experience in that time. The peace that we're gonna experience is unlike what we're experiencing today. What's the difference between the peace that we're gonna have there at that time and the peace that we have now. Well, let's go to the book of First Thessalonians. Let's see what the peace that we have now, because the Bible talks about what man said there's gonna be peace, what actually, what actually happens. So let's go to First Thessalonians. And you know, as we go over, this is all the notes that I have for you today. So you can just copy everything that's there in the PowerPoint. And some of them I already alluded to, like Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So again, just write down these scriptures, because again, this is like a review and a conclusion of the message. First Thessalonians chapter number five. And um, I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation tonight. So the point that I want to make is in verse number three, but just to keep it in context, let's just start at verse number one. First Thessalonians chapter five, starting at verse one. It says, now concerning how and when all this will happen. Dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Verse number three, when people are saying Everything is peaceful and secure. Then disasters, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pain begin. And there will be no escape. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So he says to the church, I don't need to write you again because I already told you that this day is coming. The day of the Lord is approaching. The day in which God will take vengeance on his adversary on the adversary of that of the church, and God will establish the day is soon approaching. Look around, look, look at what's happening in our world. Look at the elements. Look at the devastation that's being caused in the land just recently from the hurricane. It's only the beginning. We're approaching quickly the day of the Lord. So he says, I don't need to write to you concerning this because I already told you about this you already know quite well that this day is coming, unexpectedly like a thief in the night. And I want to read that again in verse number three, when, when people are saying, everything is peaceful. And that's what they're saying, everything gonna be okay. 
everything gonna be all right. You know, what you see now is gonna disappear and everything gonna be normal. Mm -mm. That's what people are saying. But that's not what we're seeing. That's what we desire, but that's not what we're seeing. So it says here, everything people will say, everything is gonna be peaceful and they're gonna be security. Everything's gonna be all right. What you see is happening now, the pandemic, you're gonna see it, but it's gonna be gone just like that. And it's still here. Still running rampant through the land. Wow. Who are you gonna believe, God or man? This is the word of the Lord. Verse number three, one more time. When people are saying everything is peaceful and security, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pain again. So you see how quickly when we say peace and security, disaster gonna come suddenly, unexpectedly. And it compares it to a woman labor pain ladies know this quite well women know this quite well who have bore children you don't know when those labor pains are going to hit you got you may have an idea the doctor may tell you you know maybe once you get into um around six months or so into the pregnancy you might start experiencing some labor pains and some may experience it during that time after that time some may even experience it before so you really don't know but when it comes, it comes suddenly, it comes unexpectedly. And so Jesus says that day is coming and it's going to come unexpectedly for a whole lot of people, not for the church, because we know he's coming. We know he's coming. All right. We know he's coming. Glory to God. So it compares that and it says there will be no escape. So remember, there's going to be a day of judgment that's coming. Revenge, avenge. The Lord will avenge the elect, the Bible says. Would not he avenge the elect who cry out before him day and night? God's people who are crying out in the earth right now about all the, unfair, the unfairness that's going on in the world. We're crying out. Then the Bible says he's going to avenge his elect who cries out before him. So the day of the Lord is coming. Oh, yes, the day of the Lord is coming. And it will be no escape for those who have done wrong, who have mistreated humanity. There will be no escape for you. Wow. So I wanted to read that, at least go down to verse number uh, three. So I'll read four just to make sure we're in context. But you aren't in dark about this, dear brothers and sisters. You won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. I go to the next verse. For you are all children of the light. And of the day, we don't belong to the darkness and the night. So be on your guard, not sleeping like others. Stay alert and be clear headed. Night is the time when people sleep. And drunkards get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear headed. Protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Isn't that beautiful? That's awesome. Awesome. Okay, so with the time that we have, if you look at Jeremiah real quick. So we're talking about the peace that we're going to have is unlike what we have now. When man said we're going to have peace, sudden destruction come. When they say everything's going to be all right, when man say everything's going to be all right, get ready, something's about to happen. That's not good. So let's look at these other scriptures before we bring this to a close. And I want you to read the whole chapter, or at least um, when you go to uh, Zechariah, I, I put uh, verse number 10, but in that one, I need you to just um, read from verse one all the way to 10, because that's a great illustration about the priesthood, those who operate in the priesthood, what you're gonna experience, what you're gonna get as a result of being a priest for the Lord. So let me just do Jeremiah real quick, and then we'll go to Zechariah, and then we'll end with Romans again, 14, 17. Jeremiah chapter number six, and these, these two verses kind of uh, say close to the same thing, so that's why I just gave you more than one. So we'll do chapter six, and again, I'm still reading from the New Living Translation. Jeremiah chapter six and verse number 14.
it says, and again, it's referring to what we talked about before, when man say peace to everybody, sudden destruction comes. So we can't depend on when man say there's gonna be peace and when man say everything's gonna be all right. The reason why, and this is what uh, Jeremiah is alluding to, he's saying what they're telling you is superficial peace. That's what they really, that's what they really giving you. They're giving you superficial peace. And that's what we read here in this verse. Jeremiah's uh, verse, uh, chapter number six, verse number 14 says, they offer superficial treatment for my people's mortal wound. Isn't that something? Isn't that what they offer us? You know, they have mortally wounded us, but they give us a superficial treatment, a little patch up, you know, a little something here and there to keep you quiet. Just a little something, not giving you what you really deserve. Isn't that what we see happening in our world? I love it here. It says, they offer superficial treatment for my people's mortal wound. This is what they offer us. They give you a little bit here and a little there. You know, you constantly keep fighting and fighting, and they just give you a little bit here and a little bit there. So the Bible says here, they offer you superficial treatment for my people's mortal, mortal wound. They give assurance of peace when there is no peace. Isn't that what we just read? So they offer superficial treatment and they offer you assurance and peace when there is no peace. They try to assure your heart and tell you everything's gonna be all right and you're still walking in fear. You still got fear in your heart because they're saying one thing and we're seeing something else. This is the word of the Lord. This is what man offers, superficial. That which only on the surface doesn't go deep. We need lasting peace. All right, so they give you assurance of peace when there is no peace. Let's go now to the same book and go to chapter number eight this time and look at verse number 11. Verse number 11 in chapter eight says, they offer you superficial treatment again for my people's mortal wounds. They give assurance of peace when there is no peace. So again, Isaiah alludes to this term, this phrase twice within a two chapter period. So again, we see the peace that we're experiencing now that man say when there's gonna be peace is not gonna be the peace that we're gonna have at that time. It's gonna be the Prince of Peace. So when he say peace and when he established peace on the earth, it will not be superficial. It will go deep and it will be lasting peace. Oh, glory to God. And now let's go quickly to uh, Zechariah. And this is the one I told you, um, I, because I don't have a whole lot of time left. I need you to read the whole chapter, at least read chapters, um, uh, the, the beginning of the chapter, chapter three, from one to uh, 10. And it talks about Joshua and it talks about the priests. And he talks about what he's going to do for the priest. But then he also says, when you read it from the New Living Translation, this is not just for Joshua the priest, but all those who are the priests of the Lord are going to experience this blessing. All those who serves as priests here in the earth. All right, because remember, those of us who are born again, we have been made kings and priests. So let me show you that real quick, even before we go to Joshua, um, sorry, Zechariah, before we go to Zechariah 3. Let's go to the last book of the Bible. Go to the book of Revelation real quick. Chapter number one. And I'm making reference to what you're going to read in Zechariah when you read chapter three, one through 10, where he's talking about Joshua the priest, but then he says all the priests, all of us who have been priests and made, been made priests unto God, we're going to experience the blessing of the priesthood, of being a priest for God. And a part of that blessing is reigning during that thousand years. So if you chose to be a priest for the Lord and represent him in the earth, because remember, a priest is one who stands in the gap between God and mankind. The only way mankind is going to see God is they have to see God through you. You're the mediator between God and man, just like Jesus is the mediator between God and the church. We are priests in the earth to be a mediator between mankind and God so that God can see, that man can see God through us. And this scripture in Revelation um, just verifi verifies the fact that we have been made king and priest unto God. 
Uh, now, I know it reads that way in the uh, King James. So let me do that. Let me go to the King James first. And then if I need to, I can read the same verse in the New Living Translation. So Revelation chapter number one, look at verse number six. It says, and have made us kings and priests unto God, his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So that's clear. We don't even have to read that from the New Living Translation. That's clear. It says, and hath made, and hath made, past tense, and hath, or we would use the word has, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Isn't that beautiful? God hath made us, past tense, to be king and priests. He made us to be royalty. Always wanted us to be royalty from the very beginning. But we have not operated in that role yet of royalty here on the earth. But we will if we operate as priests. So remember, God always called those things that be not as though they were. He sees the beginning and he sees the end of everything. So what he saw was, he saw us operating as kings. That's why it says kings first. He saw us operating as kings in the earth when he set Adam up. But Adam messed that up. So now we got to operate as priests and then become kings. We can do it, family. So let's stand in the gap now and be a witness for him. And when we operate as priests in the earth, one day we'll operate as kings. Isn't that awesome? Wow, I love it. God always intended for us to operate as kings. You know, and I just got that revelation just by doing this whole series. Because I was wondering why he always put kings first when we're actually operating here as priests. That's because God had always saw us as kings in the earth. But we lost that through Adam's fall. But if we operate now as priests, he has made us to be priests, and we represent him in the earth, guess what? We're going to come back, and we're going to reign on this earth as king of kings with him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. That makes me shout. So that's clear. So now let's go back to Zechariah. I don't have to read that one from the New Living Translation. That was clear. That was one of those King James Version uh, verses that when you read it, it, it sounded like English. All right, so let's go back to Zechariah. And again, read chapter three, verses one through 10, and you'll see all of that. Talking to Joshua, but he says to all the priests, this is gonna be the blessing that you're going to experience when you carry out your priesthood in the earth during this dispensation called grace. And also during that millennial reign too, we'll still be operating as kings and priests at that time. Kings and priests. It's almost like this time we're operating as priests and kings because we're priests now looking to become kings. Zechariah chapter three, and I'm back in the New Living Translation. And let me just see if I want to, and again, it talks about Satan, talks about the accuser of the brethren, Satan being cast out. All right, I love it. He's getting, he gotta be cast out. It talks about us in verse number three. When you read verse number three, I'm not gonna read through all because we don't have a lot of time, but when you go to verse number three, it talks about us uh, being in filthy garments and he's, he take away our filthy garment and give us a robe of righteousness. We all were before God as filthy rags in our own righteousness. But when we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he cleansed us and gave us a, a, a new garment. That's what you read in verse number three. And it says he takes away our sin. Oh, I love it. All right, he takes away our sin. He gives us a, a, a new garment, fine clothes. He gives us a turban to put on our head. That's verse number five. He dresses us up in white which represents the purity of the saints. Wow, this is beautiful. Then when you keep on reading, uh, verse number six, and the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Joshua, or Joshua saying, this is what the Lord of the heaven army said. And remember, we read that earlier when we was reading in Micah, the heaven's army is still talking about the Lord. He's the Lord of hosts, which means he's in charge of the heavenly army. This is Jesus talking. If you follow my ways, and carefully serve me. He's saying this to all the priests. If you follow my ways in this dispensation called grace. He says, if you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyard. What does that sound like? That sounds like the millennial reign. He's saying, listen, if you follow me, if you keep my commandments, you do what I commanded you to do. 
and you serve me with your life, you serve me carefully, I'm gonna give you authority over the temple and its courtyards. I will let you walk among these others standing here. So it's talking about the courtyards, the setup in Jerusalem, the kingdom that's gonna be set up. If you obey him and you serve him in this dispensation, he said, I'm gonna give you authority to, to walk in and out. Wow. Listen, this is awesome. When you go into details about the city of Jerusalem, matter of fact, we didn't even do all of that. And I think I'll talk about that when we do the piece on heaven, when we talk about heaven. There are going to be people that's going to be, as a, fact, as a matter of fact, when heaven is set up, it's going to be set up similar to what the millennial reign is going to be like. But the only difference, though, and we'll do this when we start talking about heaven, everybody will not be able to go in and out of Jerusalem at that time. Because the Bible talks about, you know, the kingdom of God being set up with the 12 gates, the 12 gates made out of pearls, and the 12 gates have, each one of them have the name of the disciples on it, and it's talking about God's kingdom. And that kingdom is also going to be set up in Jerusalem, but at that time, everybody will not be able to go in and out like they will be able to during the thousand-year reign. Because remember, we, we read earlier, everybody's going to stream to Jerusalem to hear the law and the word of the Lord, but during the time of heaven, when heaven is established, guess what? everybody's not going to be able to go in and out of the city. Only certain people are going to be able to live in the city. Guess who that's going to be? Guess who's going to be able to live in the city and who's going to be able to go in and out of the city, out of the city, and who can't go in the city at all? Wow. You got to be around when I do that series on heaven. All right, let me keep reading. I got about, what, ooh, maybe like five minutes or so. So he said, I'll let, you, I'll let you walk among these others standing here. Verse number eight, listen to me, O Joshua, you high priest, and all you other priests, that's us. So he said, listen to me, Joshua, you priest, and all you other priests. You are symbols of things to come. You are an example of what's to come. Family of God, priests of the most high, those of us God have made to be king and priest. He's talking to you. I love it. He says, you are a symbol of things to come. Soon, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Oh, I love it. And notice the word branch is capitalized. He said, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Ooh, that's talking about Jesus. He's the branch and the offspring of Jesse. Oh, you got to read that in Isaiah chapter number 11. We didn't get a chance to go there, but read that. Because remember, we, we read Isaiah chapter 2. But read Isaiah chapter number 11 too as an example to show you the type of spirit that the spirit that the son the spirit of God will reign through this branch called Jesus, the offspring and the son of Jesse, the spirit that Jesus will be operating in during that thousand year reign. We saw it in his life as he walked here on the earth among men, but we're going to see it in his fullness during that thousand year reign. Hallelujah. So he said, Joshua, this is not just for you, but this is for all the priests. You are assembled. I'm going to bring my servant. I'm going to bring the branch, Jesus. Verse number nine, now look at this jewel I have set before Joshua, a single stone with seven facets. I will engrave an inscription on it, saith the Lord of the heaven's army. And I will, listen to what he says he's going to do now. He's going to establish his kingdom here on the earth. He says, I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. Wow. He said, when he come and establish his kingdom, he's going to wipe out sin in the land in one day. Mm, 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 mm. What a time, what a time. From day one of the thousand year reign, it's going to be beautiful. He says, in a single day, I'm going to wipe out all sin on the land. Woo! Glory to God. You won't be there for day one. You're talking about a good time. The first day of a thousand years, the first day, all sins will be removed in a single day. That's verse number nine. Verse number 10, that's the verse I had you to go to, which is the last verse. And on that day, say the Lord of the heaven's army, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit with you peacefully under your own grapevine and fig tree. Wait a minute, what is that symbolic of? Didn't we just read that earlier in the book of Micah? Oh, glory to God, this is awesome. So the Lord makes it clear that on that day, the Lord of the heaven army, he said this, each of us will be able to invite our neighbor. It's going to be a beautiful time. You're going to be able to invite your neighbor. You know, like, you may say now, you know, there's certain people I can't invite because I don't know them. They say, you're going to be able to invite your neighbor. 
Who is my neighbor? And somebody asked Jesus that one time, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Those that do the will of the Lord. Those that serve the Lord. That's your neighbor. That's your brothers and sisters. So at that point, everyone will be your neighbor. Because remember, all nations are going to be flowing to Jerusalem. And in one day, God's going to wipe out the sin. And he's going to allow you to invite your neighbor, every one of you. Because remember, we're all going to have our own grapevine, our own fig tree, our own acres, our own mule. You want to throw that in there. You'll be able to invite your neighbor to do what? To sit with you peacefully. Here it goes again, peace. Sit with you peacefully under your own, it says. Your own. God's going to see to it that everybody have their own. Oh, what a time it's going to be. And I'll end by going to Romans chapter 14. This is my scripture that God placed in my heart to name our television broadcasts after that should be coming on real soon. We'll keep you updated with our television broadcast that's going to be coming on Preach the Word Network entitled Enjoying Kingdom Living. Should be coming to you real soon. We'll let you know about that. But God gave me this scripture in Romans to use as a part of what we're going to be talking about, similar to what we're sharing now, just taking it to another level, really focusing on the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And I'm going to show you in our teachings that's coming up, how much Jesus talked about the kingdom, starting with John first, the Baptist, and then Jesus coming along talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. 95% of Jesus's messages was about the kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Everything he said had to do with the kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. And when this gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world as a witness to all men, the Bible says, then shall the end come. So when we come back the next time, we're going to talk about, about that, about how much Jesus talked about the kingdom. You'll be surprised how many verses in the Bible. And every time Jesus opened his mouth, it was saying something about the kingdom. That's what it really means to preach the gospel, to preach the kingdom. So let's end with this, Romans chapter number 14 and verse 17. I'll read it um, both from the King James and I'll read it also from the New Living Translation. So I'll do um, New Living Translation first. And then I'll do Romans uh, chapter 14 from the King James. So New Living Translation say this and we'll do this and we're closing. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness. And really, that this is one of the reasons why I didn't focus too much on this translation for this particular scripture, because in the King James, it does not use the word goodness. It used the word righteousness. And there is a difference between righteousness and goodness. So let's be clear on that. This really should be righteousness. But I want you to see that just, just in case, you know, we've been using the New Living Translation and then you read it and say, wait a minute, this says goodness. And it says righteousness, righteousness in King James. So let's be clear. We go by the original text which is the King James Version, and it says righteousness, not goodness. So this is a bad um, interpretation or translation of that word. They, they substituted the word righteousness for the word goodness, which was not good. Changes the whole meaning. All right, but again, I'm just going to read through it, and then we'll, go, we'll end with King James. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what you eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness or righteousness. And then they have the rest of it, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approach you too. And others will approach you too. All right, so, and I wanna end by going to the King James Version and reading that verse and then we're done for tonight. King James Version says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. See the difference? And so this is why when I use New Living Translation, I always use King James too. So to see if there's any changes that throws things off, we make that clear. So we only use it just to bring clarity in certain scriptures. But when it deviates from the truth of the scripture, we go right back to King James. So King James says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that, for he that in these things serve Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. Well, I hope you've gotten something out of the word tonight. We're looking forward to that time of everlasting righteousness. He will be ushering in everlasting righteousness, everlasting peace, and everlasting joy in the Holy Ghost.
what a time that's going to be. And that's the prerequisite before we get to heaven. Heaven is going to be a million times better than the millennial reign. You say, wow, it's going to be better than the millennial reign based on what you shared already about what we're going to experience? Yes. Eyes haven't seen. That's why you need to stay in love with the Lord. That's why you need to continue to serve him until your assignment is done here on earth. Because he that endured to the end shall be saved. I hope you got something out of the word tonight. And I hope that this series has been a blessing to you. Understanding the realm of the spirit, the spirit of the Lord has spoke it. Some things that's going to happen and some things that's going to come to pass. We want to be on the Lord's side, raising our hands in victory when everything is said and done. I got a question for you. The late Reverend Timothy Rice said this, where do you stand? Who's on the Lord's side? That's the question I have for you tonight. Where do you stand in your relationship with the Lord? Are you on the Lord's side? Well, if not, I want to give you an opportunity to know him. The Bible says that you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Say this with me. Say, Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. He died for my sins. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you now as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for washing away my sins and making me a child of God in Jesus' name. Well, if you just prayed that prayer, very sweet, short, and simple. If you prayed it with your mouth and meant it with your heart, you are saved right now. Please let us know that you received Jesus as your Lord. And I want to encourage you, please get in a church somewhere, a Bible-based church that's teaching the word of God with simplicity and understanding so that you can grow in your walk with the Lord. Until next time, remember these words. God is on the throne. Jesus is Lord. And the devil is defeated. God bless your family.